Guten Morgen. Happy Monday. It is Monday, October 8th, 2018. In, uh, in America, they call it Columbus Day. In Kenyatta, they call it Thanksgiving. So, happy Thanksgiving. Hope you're enjoying the holiday. My wife and children are way upstairs. Fast asleep. I'm up. I'm working. I also have about, I don't know, stacks of homework for school this this tall. So, anyways, I apologize for the, the casual um, dress, but it is a holiday. I am focused on schoolwork. <laughs> but, anyways, happy Thanksgiving if you're Canadian. Canadian. Uh, so, we're here. We're here to work. We're here to set up the week. We can go through the calendar. We can go through the charts. Maybe we'll make it a quickie. I don't know. But without further ado, let's get going, huh? Can you hear the... Can you hear my voice? All right, good. Well, good morning then. Loud and clear. All right, well, good morning. So like I said, we'll go through the calendar, we'll go through the charts, and uh, we'll make it a quickie. With that in mind, let me remind you that trading and investing is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. But please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. My name is Wayne McDonald. I am the Chief FX Market Strategist for TradersWay.com. Nice to meet you, by the way. Please ask questions, get involved. I have a lot of trading experience, technically, fundamentally, and all that other kind of jazz. I'm here to help you make, make you a success sooner. Then later, I don't have a watch on today. Panerai looks dull. Anyways, I'm here to make you a success sooner than later. So the best way to have that happen is for you to get involved. I call it participation. Ask questions. Jeff says, do you went to Harvard? I go to Harvard right now. So I probably have six hours of homework to do today on a holiday. Yeah, I'm in grad school. I want to be a big boy one day. Can you maybe walk through how to use the most important profiles to check the market relative strength time frames? Sure. So Jacques, did you download the, the, the templates then? Yeah, okay, so you got the files. So you want to play around with how to use them. I know. Well, you guys are asking me. I get all kinds of hate mail, like, your cup is too big. Now what? So here's my coffee cup from yesterday, my travel mug. Uh, now it's too small. All right, so anyways... Yeah, I, I can do that. Why not? Right, we can do a, do a moment here. But, uh, oh, yeah, so with, with all this, why am I doing? What's the reason to do these webinars? Well, there's a two-step process here. One, I would like to help you get on the path to becoming a successful Forex trader. And two... I'd like to get you on the path to opening a live account at tradersway.com. Okay? Makes sense? So please do it. Oh, where can we download the files? All right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I got a link somewhere. Hang on. Hang on, there it is. 
Almost done. Hang on. Click, copy, uh, and then paste. Paste. Okay. Yeah. Well, one is weekly, one is monthly. Yeah. So that's what I use over and over and over again. So people are downloading the pivots and then they're like, but it doesn't look like Wayne. People are freaking out and like, cause they don't know how to adjust and customize the, the EA. So um, what I've done is given you the, or the indicator, but also my chart templates. So it makes those adjustments and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, rank a Harvard booster. Well, no, what I was trying to explain is I have like six weeks of homework or six hours worth of homework today on a holiday so i get myself into moods you know like you have to excite yourself so yeah all right so what was the question again oh yeah how to do relative strength ba, ba, ba. okay so one of the ways of doing this is you can go to these scans that i've given you scan aussie scan cad scan swissy so on and so forth okay so we can go to scan dollar. One of the things I like to double check is make sure everything is on the same time frame. So daily and five minutes would not be appropriate. So let's go like one hour, one hour, one hour, put everything on the same time frame. One hour, that's good. That's four hour. Let's do one hour. That's 15 minutes to one hour. Because you have to measure everything on the same time frame, right? Apples for apples. The next thing you want to make sure is the dollar, since we're measuring the strength or weakness of the dollar, that the dollar is on the right side or the, let's say the same side. So uh, uh, pound dollar, Kiwi dollar, dollar CAD. No, that, that would not be a good measure. So I need to have Aussie dollar. We call this the common denominator. The USD should be the common denominator. Now, if you remember your math, the numerator is on the left. So USD yen, USD CAD, and Euro USD. Well, that's no good. Um, I guess it's this Kiwi. Let's change Kiwi to something else. Let's move Euro up here so that the denominators match. But now the numerator doesn't match with the Kiwi. But I don't trade Kiwi as much as I would Aussie. So let's change the numerator now on this Kiwi trade, what else could we put here? We have USD yen, USD CAD, what else could we put down here? How about USD Swiss franc? Okay. So now they all match. USD yen, USD CAD, USD Swiss franc. Pound USD, Euro USD, Aussie USD. Common denominators, common numerators. Cool. Right? Cool. So now we got a balanced uh, market which we can analyze. So if the dollar is strong, you would see the top pairs falling and the bottom pairs rising. If the dollar is weak, you would see the top pairs rising and the bottom pairs falling. So if we see that across the board, one or the other, then we know if the dollar is strong or weak. Okay. If we see a mixed bag, then the dollar is neutral and you probably want to stay away from it. What's going on? Elvin, you have a low resolution screen. I can't do anything about that. Uh, it's not, it's not broadcasting in HD. Kevin says, oh, that's a smart way of doing it. <laughs> of course it is, Kevin. <laughs> um, the only thing I can think of is I made a change over the weekend, um, to try to, because there's a lag in the chat and sometimes it's a minute, minute and a half. I don't know why YouTube needs such a delay. So I made some changes to tweak it so it would have less of a delay, but maybe it killed 
the resolution. All right. I think it's more like 360. Yeah, well, you can adjust it on your, right, browser. All right, so looks like most people can handle it. So figure it out, right? All right. All right. Oh, and then that's funny. This should be. Anyways, it was on auto. Okay. Yeah. All right. So anyways, we're looking for congruency. Look at all these big boy words, huh? We're looking for congruency in either the, well, in both the numerator and denominator of these pairs, okay? So, for example, if pound dollar has been down the last, let's say, eight or nine hours, you could say, oops, you could say over the last eight or nine hours, the dollar's been stronger than the pound. And then you could look at the euro and say, well, over the last eight or nine or 10 hours, right, 12 hours, the dollar's been stronger than the euro, so we've accumulated some knowledge. Dollar stronger than pound, dollar stronger than euro, and then what about Aussie? Has the dollar been stronger than the Aussie? Yeah, I don't know whoever said 720p is HD, right? We have 4K screens now. Right, so what is it, 2160p? That would, right? So, but it is, whatever. All right, so we've learned a couple of things. Dollar stronger than pound. Dollar is stronger than euro. Aussie is stronger than dollar. Whoa, so the first thing I can think of is looking at selling pound Aussie, selling euro Aussie. Okay. You see that? That's interesting information, isn't it? So now look at, let's zoom in a little bit here on USD, uh, 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 USD yen. Yen is stronger than dollar. But dollar is stronger than CAD. Holy smokes. So what have we learned here? CAD yen must be going straight down. And what about Aussie yen? Or uh, sorry, uh, uh, CAD Aussie. Aussie CAD. Okay. Dollar stronger than CAD, but Aussie stronger than dollar. So Aussie CAD must be amazing, right? Same thing. Yen is stronger than dollar. So you wouldn't want to trade Aussie uh, yen because they're, they're both strong. Okay, and what else? Dollar is stronger than Swiss franc. So you could do pound Swissy, Euro Swissy. Well, actually you might even call it neutral, really, over the last several hours, you might call it neutral. Your email provider, you know, it's just an email. John, it's just an email that says click here to the download page. Uh, no, Langa, you're going to have to do it yourself. I can't email it to thousands of people individually. Now, let me ask you something, John. Are you, are you selecting beginner or like new trader, break even trader or profitable trader? Which one are you selecting in the survey? Maybe, uh, maybe there's one branch of it breaking down. 
profitable. So profitable ain't sending out, huh? Well, I did update it over the weekend. See, I worked over the weekend to do this for you guys, um, as well as doing homework, as well as spending time with family that's visiting, and as well as taking my kids, my wife and kids, to a fair. All right. So profitable is breaking down. All right. I, th I thank you for that. I will look into it. Brook used profitable and downloaded fine. So anyways, um, no, I work hard, but right. All right. So anyways, so you see this, we're trying to find what we could trade. So dollars pretty strong here, but not as strong as Aussie. Right? Dollar's pretty strong, but not nearly as strong as yen. So you'd want to say, well, Aussie and yen seem to be quite strong. So the best things to do would be sell pound yen, sell euro yen, right? Sell pound Aussie, sell euro Aussie. Now, USD is quite quite a bit stronger than CAD as well, right? So sell CAD yen, sell or, or buy or whatever it is for Aussie CAD. Is it Aussie CAD or CAD Aussie? It's not something I trade that much. I don't even have it up here anymore. Okay, so you see what I mean? So let's go to Beast. Okay, and sure, it fell off the face of the earth. Okay, that's how you use it. Okay. Pretty nice, right? Of course, all you had to do is be, you know, the person that sold at resistance. That's all you had to do. I think the swing trading group yesterday, which I also did on top of all that other work, I think we, we talked about this because it looked like it was taking off. And I just laughed like, now you want to be brave. Now you want to buy. I'm like, but but you're buying that resistance, you'd just be an absolute total fool. And good. I'm glad it didn't break out because that would have made my job as a teacher 10 times more difficult. Oh, what are those dots? That's parabolic stop and reverse. So it's uh, training wheels. If you don't know where to place your stop loss, that's where you place. That's where you place it right there. Now it tells you how to move your stop too. You see how the the dots are moving. It's suggesting where to move your stop at the end of each candle, and it makes the suggestion based on volatility. The higher the volatility, the less it will move your stop. So for example, look at the size of these candles. Extreme high volatility, right? Look, it didn't move the stop at all. Okay. Now maybe it's not apparent in a sideways market, but um, when volatility wanes, so look at look at this example here. Let me let me draw a line. I'm talking about this move here. Okay. Let me get this out of the way a little bit, okay? As it's falling, it's falling fast, right? See this? Generally, it's quite fast. It's barely moving the stop what, at all. And so it's trying, okay, parabolic stop and reverse. Yeah, PSAR, Par, uh, right? So even though the volatility is high, it's barely moving the stop. And the reason for that is 
it wants to let the winners run. So as long as there's high volatility, it's not going to move the stock. But, however, when you lose volatility and the market starts to consolidate like it is doing down here, it moves the stop quite significantly. So you, you see we move, let's say we move this amount, okay, okay, we move, we move that amount, gee whiz, I can't grab this, there you go, we move that much and we we basically didn't move the stop at all, right? And now down here, check this out. We move hardly anything in price, but look how much we move the stop. Oops. I hope you're getting this. It's kind of hard to explain, right? So we move the stop from here to here, but price did hardly anything. But when we move from here to here, the stop barely moved. Okay. Kevin, I don't trust any settings, Kevin. They're just settings. Yeah, John, well, why would that be? Like, the service provider is obviously sending the, the email. Oh, you know what it is? You can't see that far left. Sorry. Um, let's do a different example. Let's do it again. I'm sorry. You couldn't see that far left. All right. Uh, let's talk about this. Well, we can talk about this move. Okay. This is a significant move in price upward. Okay. Meanwhile, the stop move from here. Ah. Dang it. Meanwhile, the stop moved from here to here. Okay? That's how much the stop moved in that same time period. Significantly different, right? So price was volatile. It moved from here to here. But the stop just moved from here to here to here to here to here. Hardly anything. Okay, and then you look at periods of consolidation and it moves the stop quite a bit, quite quickly. All right, so you, like from here to here to here to here, it moved the stop. So anyways, what is it trying to do? It's trying to lock in profits when the market is consolidating, but when the market is rallying, it tries to let it run. Jacques says, is parabolic pretty dependable? It's an algorithm. It works 100% of the time. Now, if you're making trading decisions on this, I mean, you guys, you have to get past, like, which indicators make you money. None of them make you money. They're just algorithms. So what it's really doing is measuring volatility. Which one do I trust? What do you mean trust? It's an algorithm. It's math. Do you trust calculus? Right? So it's just measuring volatility. That's all it does, and it works 100% of the time. But you need to make decisions. Okay? But it's, it's, only, it's, it, it, it's not really a stop-loss indicator. That's not what it, it's not making decisions for you. It's measuring volatility and putting a little black dot on the chart. Okay? That's all it's doing. So now you have to say, well, based on this knowledge of volatility consolidating, maybe I should make a decision. Okay? But if I don't use PSAR all day, every day, like put it this way, if it made me money, if all I had to do is, oh, book, PSAR says stop, so stop. I would just, that that's all I would have all day, every day, right? What is most important? Price action, support and resistance. Do you have to have volatility? Well, you could use, um, 
you know, you could use uh, Bollinger Bands as a measure of volatility. Now, it's quite different than PSAR. But I don't need those to, to make money. Right? These moving averages, I like to use them to indicate direction and speed. Don't have to have those, right? Okay? So you got to change your mindset about, you know, and I'm being picky, I know, but this whole idea like which, which, which indicator do I trust? That's a big word. I don't trust human beings, right? Which one do I trust? Which one do I like? Which one? Oh, oh evade. No, 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 no. They're just, uh, they just print colors. Okay. But you could use, for example, in the beginning, you could use them to write to place a stop. Now, if you go out and start Googling like ways to trade Bitcoin and become a billionaire in three days using PSAR, you're going to find something um, that, and they'll say, when the dots are above, you sell. When the bots, dots are on the bottom, you buy. And it looks pretty good, right? Except by the time you're selling or buying, you're like a, a, a country mile late. Okay? So they don't make trading decisions for you. Okay? So don't even say things that are kind of like that because you're going to start thinking it. I have to wipe this away from your brain. Okay, it's just a, a measure of volatility. Oh, cool. Like, think of this. What did I tell you last week and the week before? Sell at the top, buy at the bottom. Sell at the top, buy at the bottom. Sell at the, that had nothing to do with PSR, right? And look, by the time PSR tells you to buy, so we'll, we'll play with that idea. Buy at the bottom, you know, use PSR. To, look where PSR tells you to buy. Okay, that's where the, the dot dropped low. Do you see how if you sold, right, if you sold at this dot, you you were 50% late. If you bought at that dot, you're 50% late. You'd lose over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. All of these would be losers. So get this. Which one do I trust? I think if you traded with PSAR, you'd probably lose all your money. No, I know. I know, Jacques. I have to be careful. You said it. I can't I can't interpret what you meant. You only said what you said. And therefore, with lots of people watching, you know, a thousand people are going to watch this video. I need to make sure that what you said is what I interpret, what and what I say gets interpreted by other people. This is a very important thing. Which one do I trust? I don't trust it at all. Okay. But let's say you're already in because you bought for some reason. All right, let, let's make up a reason, um, a breakout. Okay, so you can you can see this is a clear range. Let me double check. You can see. Okay, yeah, you can see. Okay, so how do you trade a, a range? Breakout, pullback. Okay, great. So it breaks out, pulls back. I'm not even looking at PSR. Okay, and now I buy. Okay, see, PSAR is not even on the clue train yet. All right, so I buy, and this thing starts rallying up, right? Finally, PSAR gets on the clue train, so I can move my stop if I wanted to. I can move it to there, and then another candle goes by. I can move it there, and then another candle goes by. I can move it, you know, there. Another candle goes by. I can move it there. Okay, now you see the big gap? The, there's a big difference between these two PSRs and the first two PSRs, right? That's because we're moving sideways now, so it's jamming its stop quickly. Okay? And then volatility takes off again, and the stops don't move for, you know, several hours, almost a whole day. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not picking on you, Jacques, but it's, I have to get your language right. 
because it now maybe you know it, you know there could be things like you know language differences and stuff. It doesn't matter if you're in my office. I and I was the the, the guy running the firm. I have to be very careful, right? When you say something, it it could mean it could be an interpretation of the way you think, and therefore I have to attack that if it sounded like you're going to make uh, that I was paying you to let PSAR make your decisions for you, right? No, no, I'm paying you money so you make the decisions, right? So, anyways, it, it's it's a fine line, but I got to be on that, right? So, if you were in because of the pullback then you can kind of use PSR a little bit as your guide. Um, you might find it works better on bigger time frames and all that kind of stuff. But uh, be careful when you Google, you know, how to, how to, you know, how to become a billionaire overnight using PSR. I'm sure you're going to find lots of sales pitches. Okay. And the, they're, they're stupid. So they're just a measure of volatility, and you can you just even think of the idea of it. When when the market is moving, you should let your winners run when you're making money, right? Because why would you be in a volatile trade that you're losing on, right? That doesn't make any sense. So you're in a trade, it takes off, you're making a ton of money. PSR would tell you, don't do anything, don't move your stop. Well, maybe move your stop to break even, right? But but just let it run. Just keep letting it run, let it run and run and run. Then when it starts consolidating near resistance, in this case, if you were a buyer, then jam your stop closer and lock in as many pips as possible. That's kind of what it's suggesting. Okay. Oh, committee directs the desk to continue rolling over at auction amount. All right, so they're they're saying that part of their balance sheet they want to roll over, which means uh, a maturity comes and it, uh, let's say an asset matures, a, a thirty day asset, a ninety day asset, a three year asset, whatever. And this asset has a date that it expires. Okay. And what they're saying is, when it expires, go out and buy another one. Just replace it with something new. So if it was 30-day debt, roll it over, buy another 30-day debt. Okay, don't go to cash. Okay. Well, all right, so Lim Kung Bun says, hey, bro, can you check the pound kiwi? No. And I'll tell you why. I just did a relative strength exercise like 15 minutes ago that said, the pound is, is fairly weak and the kiwi is fairly weak. So why would I want to look at that? Okay, so I did. I just taught you guys how to do relative strength. And based on that, it seems like even if that is working for you, right? Even if you're making money on kiwi, uh, a pound kiwi, there's significantly better things for you to be doing. That's all. Kevin says, how do you know when to get out of a trade? When you hit your target, Kevin, based on your trade plan. Okay. So what's the trade plan here on this daily pound yen? Give me one trade plan. Okay. Yeah, I'll do gold. Yep, yeah, I'll do gold. But I, I guess you missed the, the first part of the webinar, that's all. Okay, this is dropping to 141.50. See, that's my trade plan. So when should I get out? Somewhere between 141.50 and 139.50. So, you know, 140, 141.50. That's that's the conservative plan. That's the aggressive plan. Okay. There's actually a third one where you're going to run into a problem. 
and that's when uh, let me do this one now okay so really that's probably plan a actually so it's probably I got it backwards plan C plan B plan a okay Gold collapsing as we speak. Well, the market is opening, so you know it's the market open, right? Before you get all excited, remember, and if something exciting is happening, you should be very suspicious of why you didn't know it was happening. Okay. Dollar strong, dollar strong, uh, dollar strong. Dollar and Swissy strong. Yen even stronger. Aussie even stronger. So the, the two strongest seem to be Aussie and um, Yen. So like if someone said, if Bun said, hey, bro, can you check Aussie Yen? I'd say, no, why would I check Aussie Yen? Aussie strong and so is Yen. Why would I look at those two things, right? So it could be dollar related, and right? It could be something else. So let's take a look. Remember, we had this range bound and breaking out and all kinds of things. Let's go to the other one. Okay. But by the way, what's supposed to happen when the dollar is strong? Let's go to this one. Gold falls. Gold falls, man. That's it. Okay. We had it here. All right. So there was, if you go back two weeks, I did this during non-farm payrolls, right? Let me give it a click. Uh, we did this a couple of weeks ago where we just had it like this. I added the third one where I said, if you happen to be a bull and you think it's going to break out. That, okay. This is what we had before non-farm payrolls on Friday. So if you go all the way back to Thursday and then all the way back to the week before, remember how we had this here and then the second plan was to buy it here? Remember, this was the target. And as long as it stays in the range, there's a high probability it just comes back to the bottom of the range, right? We talked about this not even for days, but for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, for like the last 12 weeks. Same old song and dance, right? You see what I mean? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be amazed at this. It is moving. There is volatility. But, I mean, my gosh, we talked about this for days that it would go up, probably hit resistance, and then probably come down because it's range bound, right? Well, okay, John, you know, uh, you know, it's a holiday week in the largest trading market. You know, um, there's a lot of things that could be going on. Dollar is strong. Gold is coming down. But um, put it this way, like we talked about this you know, on Wednesday of last week that this is set up. You have permission to think about selling gold down back into right to support. Um, just like this was an opportunity to buy it back into resistance. So like for it to be falling now, I mean, if you're looking at it now on a five minute chart, you're going, holy crap. But on this chart, you're like, yeah, we, we actually talked about it four or five days ago. So to other people, it's just happening, right? Also, look at the swing trade, right? It's just a swing trade. What, the, the only thing that makes it interesting is the velocity, right? Well, in that case, maybe it drops all the way down to our green zone, which means our, our support is actually a little bit lower. And if we hit this today or tomorrow, then, you know, it's still likely to do this. Okay. It's only, it's, it's only exciting, like velocity and stuff. You can't really plan because you don't know when everyone else is making the trades, but it's only ex exciting and surprising to people that didn't know the trade. Right. So now someone's going to jump in it because it's moving, but you know, I'm sure most people in this room have tested that that philosophy of 
wait for it to move, and then jump in late. And I think the vast majority of people would agree they've tested that thoroughly and have found it not to work. So like, you know, so one thing like, John, you're working on front running, right, which is something that you've never done before. It's a new process, right? So uh, the front run strategy would have you short at this uh, uh, 112.05 level on Friday, right? And now, so if you'd shorted up there based on the front run, what would you be thinking now? That you're a genius, right? You're like, oh my God, look at this, this thing is falling like a ton of bricks. I can't spend the money fast enough. But it's not that you're a genius and all that kind of stuff. But it shouldn't be surprising either. The only thing is how fast it fell. You're like, whoa, look how fast that fell. Right? You know, right, and, and that's fine, John, but this is something you should work on for the next five or six or seven years, right? But what what do we know? Is this trending or is it moving sideways? What can we say is factual? I can't remember this. Sure, Jacques, but that's why you drop into a small time frame. Yeah, it's moving sideways and it's factual, right? So it will move sideways. And listen to this. I've been saying this for 15 years. This will move sideways forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This thing will move sideways forever until it breaks. And when it breaks, trade the pullback. It just, it's another trade. So it's moving sideways. Great. It's going to move sideways for a thousand years. Well, of course, if it breaks, then trade the breakout. It just puts you into one trade or another trade. Okay. So I know we talked about front running this that particular Friday. Then I know we talked about buying it down here at support that particular Monday. And that we we out, we're eyeballing this, and and I know that the the thing is we actually missed the 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 logical target. We missed it by like five cents or something, right? It was supposed to, it was supposed to what we talked about was go up to here and then fall. All right, we missed it by five cents, but you can see the logic, right? This is all just resistance. This gray area is not, this gray area here is not a pivot. Is I drew it. Like that's the top of the market, that's the bottom of the market. And then what will happen next? It'll go to the bottom market and then go to the top of the market or, right? Or it'll break out and you'll say, oh, look at that, it broke out. So then you just trade the retracement, right? Uh, how does drawing too much lines on the platform help you with? Uh, it wouldn't help me. Why would you think it would help me? Yeah, well, that's how you trade a breakout, Kevin. It breaks out of the range, and you, you let it pull back to the... What I say is the return to the scene of the crime. Well, uh, something to like that, John, right? Like, that's when you're supposed to be brave, Right? That's when you're supposed to be a tough guy where you, you, you know, you hit your line, you hit your price and it looks like it's going to break out to the, you know, the upside. Well, you drop into a smaller time frame and confirm the, 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 the resistance is held. And while you're confirming, it might break to the upside and resistance didn't hold. And you say, aha, and then you set up a breakout, right? Then why did you do it? So are you telling me? Uh, Andela, that you don't know what these lines mean. Maybe that's what you're saying. Um, because the only thing I have here, Andela, 
I mean, let me get rid of these moving averages for you, right? Or actually, you know what? Let's just do it this way. Um, template. Uh, I, I created this recently. Okay. All right. Is that too many lines for you, Mandela? Is that too many lines? Right. Well, I'm asking you what you are talking about, not what you're not talking about. Is Are these too many lines? All I have is pivot points. I, I can still see. Yeah, I know. I have to have these lines. I didn't draw these lines. These Okay. Okay. That's too many lines. You don't know how to trade pivot points. All right. From my pit point of view, I think they're so important that I, I don't believe you can trade um, consistently without them. Okay. So if you were allowed one indicator and I was allowed one indicator, I think I could beat you. No, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I don't even know you. I'm so confident in these pivot points that and and I can make other decisions based on like candlestick uh, patterns and, and price action and all that kind of stuff. This is enough. I think I can go up against anybody. Okay. So the, to me, this is not too many lines. If they look like too many lines, I've, I'm going to assume you don't know what they mean. And that's a bigger problem. So I'm not like, I'm not trying to do this like I'm better than you. The point I'm trying to make is if I was mentoring you and coaching you, I would teach you to master these lines first and foremost. Okay. And if you don't know, then you have such, in my opinion, okay, this is my opinion. I've been doing this since like the beginning of retail Forex trading, right? I've been trading longer than they had charts in, in Forex accounts, right? Um, having these leading indicators and knowing what they mean are significantly important, okay? So if you don't know, you've just discovered like this unbelievably gaping hole in your knowledge as a trader. Now, a lot of people would argue against that and say, well, you know what, Wayne, you don't need these pivot points. I do just fine and all that kind of stuff. Well, great. I'm glad. Go jump in your yellow Lambo and everybody's happy. Okay. I'm telling you my point of view. You need to understand what these lines mean. And if it seems like gobbledygook to you, then you, you should just like say, all right, here's a very, very experienced trader that's been around the block for a, a, a right. And he's telling me that these are that important. Now, what did I say about PSAR? You know what I mean? What did I say about PSAR just a few minutes ago? Like, I don't care about PSAR. Get rid of it. Use it. I mean, it's just it just measures volatility. Like you can't see the volatility. But, you know, right? And then, like, do I trust them? Well, look, look, when there's volatility, let the, let your winners run. If there's volatility and you're getting and you're losing money, get the hell out, all right? So I don't need those, but that's what they tell you, right? Pivot points are a leading indicator. The other thing I use is price action. Well, I don't need to draw anything on the chart for price action. Price action is price action. So I'm combining market leading indicators to measure market i'm using leading indicators which price action right to measure price using them together i have support and resistance and just with this i can devastate any trader one-on-one -on -one. that's my opinion why because i have enough information here i i can sit here and have a career and someone will say so what is it that you do wayne well, uh, 
They use price action and pivot points. Because the rest is just it's just technical analysis, right? Like where's the support? Right? That gets easy. So that this is the why I, I use these things, right? So we're just back down to the bottom of the range. Where's the top of the range? You know, I measure them out, all that kind of stuff. So it's right. That's all you need. Uh, why don't you sign up for one of the courses, Andela? Uh, you know, for a mentorship, I charge five thousand dollars, but I don't do that. I don't generally have time. I don't think I would have time. And most people don't have the five thousand bucks. So, all right, so take take one of the courses on FX Bootcamp. Okay. All right. So that's cool. So again, I'm not trying to beat anyone down. I'm not trying to be arrogant like I'm a better trader. I'm showing you my confidence. I don't give two hoots about PSAR. I don't give two hoots really about the moving averages. I don't care about MACD. I don't care about Stokes. I don't care about your RSI. Great. You're a great trader with your RSI. All the power to you. Fantastic. CCI good for you? Awesome. You like the Elliott Wave? Ooh. Great, cool. I'm so happy for you. Um, you take away, yeah, you know, but you, nobody touches my pivots, right? Uh, FXBootCamp.com. <laughs> You can Google it and, and Google will tell you. So anyways, yeah, cool. You like stochastics? Yeah, yeah, I'm a stochastic. You know, I actually love stochastics, but then I, you know, in many cases, it uh, it just tells you the same as the 5A cross. And the reason for it is because it's using the 358 settings. But then um, it's the divergence with Stokes that I think might add uh, a benefit, right? So... I don't know, let's just pop this back open. You guys keep distracting me, but it's an interesting conversation, so we'll go there. Uh, I guess we could use the, this is my old trustworthy setup that I've been using a thousand years, right? All right, so we don't need MACD, right? This, by the way, if I draw a vertical line, okay, that's when the market went uh, bearish, by the way. Okay. Cool. All right. So we'll move this out of the way. It's funny, on this time frame, it's actually not allowing you to resell. Okay. Just looking at that. Ooh. All right. So, anyways, let's go back. I think the most important thing, whatever tool you use, you need the support and resistance. Okay. Any tool you use, you need support and resistance. Okay. And then you use your oscillators. Okay, so in a sideways market, what you're supposed to do, okay, sideways market, that has to be part of your analysis, by the way. You analyze this and you say it's sideways. Okay? Double top, triple top, quad top, right? Bottom, double bottom, triple bottom. So somewhere in the magic, uh, you declare sideways. What do you do now? You know what? Maybe I just get rid of MACD. Oops. Okay. So now what do you do? The first most important thing is you have to be at resistance. Not near it, not in the middle, not anything else. I don't care what your oscillator does. You have to be at resistance. Okay. Now the second part of this 
is then if you're at resistance or of course at support if you're a bull so let me mark that right there's this one and this one if you want okay Yeah, well, it's cheaper than hiring me for 5000 But anyways. All right. Okay, so you see what I mean? So the first thing, it all starts out with support and resistance. Then the next thing that you look at are the oscillator crossovers. Okay? So this is potentially a cell. Okay? Not that the oscillator made it, it was the resistance that made it, okay? See this oscillator cross down, were we at resistance? No, it's not a trade. Come up in here, right? Oops, I wasn't supposed to put that. Okay, coming up in here now, you follow down and you're like, oh, so that stochastic cross you can take. Okay. So if you use your oscillator correctly, um, it's like a filter. So for example, this was the first part of the top, so resistance hadn't been created yet, right? But now you, you do a second top here, And you get an oscillator crossover. Oh, by the way, I don't know if I said it in this analysis, but oscillators have to be high, not low as well. Okay, so oscillator overbought, price at resistance. Yes, you can take the 5A cross. Okay. If for some reason you had this uh, support already, let me see. Uh, yeah, you could probably argue it. Okay, let me zoom in. If you were a buyer, you would say, okay, we're at support. Okay. So, yes, at, you're at support and price is oversold. Yes, you can take the shot. So, take the 5A. Comes up to resistance, overbought at resistance, and you're a bear. Yes, you can take the shot. Okay. Like this one, as a bull, it's close. It's close. It's not great. It's close. A real decision that you need to make on this one. See, uh, yeah, you may see that may not have worked, may not have gotten you in. And there's a reason for it. It's filtering itself out. You're not really actually hitting support, even though it's oversold. It doesn't matter. You're not quite. I mean, you're close, right? This one, you're definitely not at resistance, but the but the stochastic cross down. You see what I mean? Price hit resistance. Right? So yes, you have permission. It's overbought at resistance. Yes. Now, we're on an hourly chart. So you can imagine you can get four times the candles by being on a 15-minute chart and really be in a situation where you can catch this or even a five-minute chart. You know, you should say we're at hourly resistance. And on the hourly, we're overbought on the Stokes. So then you drop into a five-minute chart and say, I'm going to take the next shot down and drop a stop just above this and I should be golden. Target's going to be back down in here. Mark, you probably need to change your resolution on on a uh, on uh, 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 YouTube. The other thing I can do is I can do this. Hang on. If it will allow me. That's weird. Okay. Oh. Keep grabbing the wrong thing.
Okay. Is that better? So, support and resistance supreme. Oh, you, you guys don't remember the Stokes? I mean, I gave you the, well, some of you guys are having no problems downloading. All right, but that's the oscillator setting. See what I mean? So, don't look at the oscillator first. Look at the support and resistance first. Are we at a key level, right? Because a lot of people might just buy this oscillator, right? That's not what's most important. The most important thing is you're at support or resistance first, and then you make decisions, right? So we're close. You might argue that we are. Okay. We're not quite touching it. And you need this to come back into the trade zone. And really what happens is you take the next 5A cross. We're a long ways. We're, we're five or six or seven hours away from that, right? And Della, why do you ask me? Why wouldn't you just go to Amazon? You're very confusing, bro. Um, please, Wayne. I need to ask you about frames to check relative strength for the day trading swing trade. Yeah, but didn't we do that, Chuck? I mean, we did that already today, right? Use, use one of these scans and then do the relative strength exercise. So like you could scan Aussie, for example. So we know Aussie is stronger than the dollar, right? And we know the yen is stronger than the dollar. So now you go to the Aussie. Aussie stronger than Kiwi. Well, make sure they're all on the same time frame, let's say. Hourly, uh, hourly, hourly, hourly. All right, so one thing to check, numerator versus denominator. Aussie is numerator, Aussie is numerator, Aussie is numerator, Aussie is denominator. All right, so kind of bear that in mind. Okay. Okay. So it depends on how, what time frame you're kind of looking at, right? If you're on a 15-minute chart versus an hourly chart versus a four-hour chart. But these three... Because Aussie is on the left, because Aussie is the numerator, they're supposed to be doing the same thing. So if Aussie dollar is falling, or if Aussie, then Aussie Swissy should be falling, Aussie Kiwi should be falling, and then uh, pound Aussie should be rising, okay, vice versa. But you have to understand that these pivots to me are often much more important. So remember when it was falling, right? What I know is this is where bears sell. This is where bears buy, uh, bulls buy. Gee whiz. This is where bulls buy. Okay. So to me, that's much more important. And then I look for congruency and stuff. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Lennox, I'm going to have to um, investigate. No, 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 no. And Dell is fine. He's asking fine questions, but it's when he's like, how do you find your website? Like, really? You Google it, right? How do you find your book on Amazon? You go to Amazon. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know how to answer the question. You go to Amazon and they will tell you the price. So uh, that's the silly part. But uh, trading questions are fine. So I'm not upset at Indella. Just needs to ask better questions. Okay. All right. So you see what I mean? Like the support and resistance is so much more important to me than what are the Aussie pairs doing over the last two hours? What I like to ask is where are we going over the entire week? Where are we going over the entire month? Because it answers so many more questions before these things happen, right? Especially in situations that we're in today where much of the market is not trading today, right? Got to keep an eye on time. Uh, much of the market is just not trading today. It's a holiday in the United States. Now, the markets are open, but banks are closed. So that means banks are not trading. The markets are open, but the banks are not trading. If the banks are not trading, do, are the big traders in the market today? Are hedge funds making their big bets today? Well, maybe, but maybe not, right? Other uh, standard pivots. Moscow Gomez says, what kind of pivots? They're just standard pivots, high, low, and close, divided by three. They're not any of the other pivots. <clears throat> so you have to go back like a thousand years ago when I was teaching myself how to trade, there were not three or four or five other different types of pivots, but I think those were created by people that want to sell you proprietary pivots because somehow their pivots are better than the normal pivots. But the reason pivots work is that pit traders would write, they would do notes on the back of their order cards because when you're a pit trader, you get orders from the head office. And they're like, all right, we got five clients that want to sell this market. And we got eight clients that want to buy this market. There's no bias. You understand that, guys? The professional trader's got, he's got some buy orders. He's got some sell orders. What's the pit trader's job? Buy it, right? Buy it at a low price, sell at a high price. Well, what is low? What is high? Like, how do you make a decision like that? Well, you look at yesterday's high, yesterday's low. Now, if you added them up, divided by two, you'd get 50%. You see what I mean? That'd be half. But that's not what pivot points are. Pivot points will take, you know, how much did the market move yesterday, which is a form of volatility, right? If they moved a lot yesterday, then there was lots of great trading. If they hardly moved at all, there was hardly any trading. Well, that's relative information. If you're going to make a decision on like, should you trade hard today or should you be conservative today? Right? You see what I mean? Okay. So we need to know how much the, the period moved because then you can line up how aggressive or conservative you are. Then the next part is we need market sentiment. Did the market change sentiment? Like, did it start bearish and ended bullish? Well, that's important information. The market at the close was bullish. Well, maybe the new period's going to be bullish too, because they were the last thing they said was buy, and then the market closed, right? So maybe there are new buyers waiting to buy because they missed out yesterday. So now they got to buy today. And, or did today start bullish but end bearish? You're like, wow, maybe the trend is reversed, right? These are all important information. So we look at the high, the low, 
and the close, because the close is the sentiment. Okay? What was the market feeling like at the end of the previous period? So high, low, close divided by three gets you a weighted average. That's all the pivot point is. And then from that, you just do some other simple calculations to get the other pivot points. It's, it's not rocket science, right? So anyways, it was simple enough where a trader would get his orders in the morning. So he heads to the floor, but the market hasn't opened yet. And he's just talking to all his buddies. Hey, what do you think? Is it going to be an up day or down day? Hey, what's going on? And, right? And then finally gets to his desk, grabs the order cards. He's got this many buys, this many sells. Well, it's his de de job to determine what price to buy and what price to sell. So anyway, so he looks at the market data on his screen. Okay, yesterday's high was this. Yesterday's low was this. Yesterday's close was this. Just would add them up, divide by three. And there's sort of the central pivot. It's not a good place to buy. It's not a good place to sell. That's sort of just kind of... The, the fair market value, let's say. So that's really a, not a great place, right? So what, what he's doing is trying to figure out what are the extremes of the market. So he does a couple more calculations, and he gets like this big gray zone here or this big gray zone here. So the determination is made. The sell orders are going to go here, maybe here, and maybe here, let's say, okay? And the buy orders are going to go here, uh, maybe, uh, no, that was wrong, hang on, let me redo this. Maybe there, but not probably. This is what I wanted. Um, you know what, let me just do it this way. Plan A, plan B, but not likely. And then plan C would be to buy it way down there. And they're just the exact opposites you may notice. Sell, 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 buy, buy, buy. Yes! That's a revolutionary observation if you had it. Yes, they are opposites. Bulls need bears. Bears need bulls. And what a lot of new traders are doing is they're somewhere in the middle. And they're being destroyed because they're putting money in the market in nomad's land and you're getting shot by the Allied and the Axis machine guns, right? Right? You're, you're stepping up the ladder and you're walking through the barbed wire and then you're like, you know what? This is a great place for a picnic. So you put on your blanket and you get your little picnic basket and you lay down and you're like, hey, are those Turks with machine guns? And then you look the, back the other way, you're like, is that the British with machine guns? Yeah, you're going to get caught up in a big fight and you're not going to win. Okay, you see what I mean? But the, this is important because if you want to buy it here, you needed these bears the week earlier. But the bears gladly sold this. We talked about it. And then it came down here and the bulls would gladly buy this. That's why it's going up, guys. See, it's not remarkable. It's not amazing. It's not like, oh my God, a triple bottom. And now it's breaking out. And oh, well, the odds... Some guys in the RBA said this, or the Swiss National Bank did that. Most of the time, this stuff is straightforward and boring. Bears are supposed to sell here, so they did. And bulls are supposed to be buying it here, and they, they may. They probably, they already started, right? Now, the next stuff is price action. So let's go through this. Bears are supposed to sell here. I knew that. It's a leading indicator. I knew before we got there. Doesn't mean they will, that's just the assumption. Then then what happens? Down, 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 down. Okay, go to the old support, drag it across, it's the new resistance. Somewhere around here I want to sell. Up, 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 sell. Not remarkable. Down, 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 down. Oh, new lower low. Look left. Drag this across. There's my new sell zone. Up, 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 up. Oh yeah, sell. 
You can see the moving averages are helping too, but I already know they want to sell. That's why, like, the moving averages are not necessarily making the decisions. I already know I want to sell around here. But then it goes up into the 21, you'll say, yeah, you know what, I'll take it. Right? I'll take it. It's the first test of the 21 after a fresh cross. Yeah, I'll take it. Easy shot. Boom. Gone. Right? And my next assumption is there's going to be a lot of bulls in here. So if I was a short-term bear, like let's say for the week, the swing plan, the swing trade would be sell around here and take profit down near the monthly, right? Okay. I can still be a bear. Why? We haven't made a higher high yet. So I don't know if bulls are taking over the market. I have one more trade to make as a bear. So I look left and I want to sell somewhere where we are now. If this now turns and makes a lower low, then my next one is to sell the retracement and then I'll make a new lower low. Okay. That's if I'm a bear. It's all pre-planned. It's all predestined. Do I know it's going to do that? No, I do not. I don't know the future. But I can say, well, on a weekly basis, I want to take it down here. But on a monthly basis, I want to keep trading this. And the real target is down here. So I have to stay bearish as long as it's bearish. Once it makes a higher high, I need to back off. Now, what if I'm not a bear? I'm a bull. Do I buy up here? No, that's I know that's where the bears are going to sell. That'd be like the dumbest place I could possibly buy it. Because I know what these lines mean. For uh, whoever it was, the person that said, what are all these lines mean? Well, I know what they mean. And that tells me don't buy it anymore. Okay. Then it comes down. I want to buy it here. So I might have to wait an entire week to buy this. I might have tried buying it here. So, you know, plan A for a bull might have been buy it there. And there might have been a shot. Didn't work out. Plan B is going to be here. Plan C, as I mentioned before, don't really like plan C, but plan D, buying it way down here. Well, under the right market conditions, like hitting the monthly target within the first two weeks. So there's a lot going on here, guys. What it doesn't tell you is whether you should be a bull or a bear. And that's your alpha. That alpha, there's alpha and beta. Beta is the market. Alpha is your ability to uh, outperform the market. And the best way I found is to make decisions based on long-term charts or fundamental analysis. So you might look at this and say, Wayne, there's a lot of charts here or a lot of lines there. Yeah, because you haven't made any decisions. So I can tell you for a fact, on the first day of month, I'd say if I was a bull, that would be my plan A. That would be my plan B. And this would be probably more, oops, let me get rid of that. This would be more like a plan C, but it's way out there. All right. And then you say, well, Wayne, there's still so many charts and there's or so many lines. Delete, delete. See, I don't need any of this stuff anymore, right? And the reason I don't need this stuff anymore is I've already made my trade plan. See that? I have three trade plans. I'm done. I'm done for the entire month. Right? You see what I mean? I don't need any of the lines anymore. I, I did my analysis and there's my trade. This was probably actually lower. Okay. So like if it starts heading up here, well, yeah, of course. Right? I'd say, yeah, of course it did. What about, okay, what if it fell f lower? Well, I'd get stopped out. <laughs> like, I'd lose, a, I'd lose 30 bips. Um, yeah. But I'm a, if I'm a bull, one of these three are going to work, and I'm going to make money. That's why I'm a bull. And it, you should have the same clarity if you're a bear. N almost nothing should be a surprise. The only surprise is the velocity, the, the velocity, and you're like, oh, boy, look at that. Okay, now bears are really now being challenged, aren't they? So 
Bears have waited a little too long. That they're approaching a seven eight six. Bears look vulnerable to me. So bulls actually have a little bit of a hope. Because if I was a bear, I would have sold this first little gray area. You understand that? Like this was a sell zone. And like this was a sell zone. Very, very, very straightforward stuff. This is just simple price action. What did I say? I don't need Stokes. I don't need MACD. I don't need the moving averages. I don't need PSAR. I don't need CCI. I need to know how to trade price action, and I need to know I need my pivots. Everything else is nice to have and are very very helpful. But if you don't understand this stuff, then they just look like a bunch of lines, and and it's because you don't get it. So peel back the layers. And start with what I'm telling you are the basics, and then add finesse over top. And Kevin says, now you just wait for the market. Yeah, well, it's better than losing money, right, Kevin? Kevin says, how do I how do I determine whether I'm a bull or a bear? Central banking policy, long-term technical analysis. One, the either, ideally both. So let's do it. Let's take a look at this. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll go daily. Okay. Oh, sorry, daily. Let's go daily. See, I immediately got to identify the support and resistance. Ooh, look at that. Those are my targets anyways, right? And then this is currently in play. Okay, great. So from this, you can make your decision. Yeah, central banking policy, I have no clue who it is. Okay, so you can take the fundamentals course at FX Bootcamp. It's probably 20 hours of central banking policy. You will learn how to manage the balance sheet of a commercial bank and then apply that um, to the money market, uh, to the money multiplier so that you can discern this, the size of, the, of um, the money supply. And then how does the central bank use and manipulate the money supply to get the outcome they're looking for to, you know, that's all there. Um, or you can take a college course. I would take uh, probably any entry level, um, ma ma uh, entry, well, macroeconomic. I guess probably just economic. Uh, an, an intro to economics class would probably do that. Just make sure it talks about fractional reserve banking, the money multiplier, and money supply. It, otherwise, if you find a class that's heavily focused on microeconomics, uh, you probably won't get that. You'll get like, uh, you know, what is it, marginal product, stuff like that, and you don't want that. Oh. Yeah, you think mic macro, but then macro can get wonky too. So uh, just... I think just introduction to um, economics, make sure they focus on those topics, or certainly an introduction to macro. Okay. So I learned macroeconomics from someone that is a senior economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Yeah. I've also studied economics, and, and I'm coming up actually in a couple of weeks, I have to go to Boston to study economics with a woman that worked for the uh, the New York Fed. Okay. Okay. All right, so I've really gone past the time. I apologize, guys. So uh, I'll be here tomorrow. I hope you enjoy your holidays. Happy Thanksgiving to all the Canadians, eh? Oh, for sure.
So, uh, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. And, you know, like when I send you guys like, hey, we'll take a course at FX Boot Camp or take a, a, a college course. Like, I totally mean it. Like, I've been in, I've been at Harvard now. This What is this, my fifth year? <laughs> you know, uh, well, I did two years part-time and three years full-time. So, yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, yeah, take a college course. Just don't go to Yale. <laughs> That's all. Um, but yeah, and like, so like the, the yeah the fundamentals course it's like a thousand bucks, right? Or of course you can buy everything for a thousand or just over a thousand bucks. But like, what does it cost me to take an economics class at Harvard? Plus, I have to fly out there a couple of times and stay in hotels and buy you know, and all that kind of stuff. The textbooks for my classes. Think of it this guy this way, guys. You can take a course at FX boot camp. For less money than I spend on textbooks for one class at Harvard. I'm like, like it shouldn't be holding you back. It shouldn't be like, oh, my God. Oh, forget it. Um, like, go to university. You go to university, they're like, buy these textbooks. You're like, oh, my God, that's $1,200 in textbooks. And then what? The professor never opens them, never talks about them, none of the information. And they're like, dude, you made me spend 1200 bucks on books. I have a stack of books six feet high. Um, it's just part of education. I mean, you gotta you gotta have a foundation of knowledge, right? You know what I mean? It's like I don't know. It's it's so normal to get an education before you start dumping money into things, right? Like you have to know what you're talking about. If you're, if you're going to do anything, you have to know what you're going to do. Right? It's the basic you, you domain knowledge. So how could you possibly be a currency trader and not know central banking, right? It's like, oh, my God, really? So now you have to write that down. Like, look, if you don't have money, then get a second job and save your money. I don't care. Do it, right? So you say, well, I need to take a class and understand economics, in particular macroeconomics. Why? Because I'm a foreign exchange trader. You have to know money supply and and international trade and like you have to know it. You're a foreign exchange trader. Okay, boom. But you don't need that first. But then like to the other person, like, what are all these lines? This is so weird. Well, you just identified something you need to know. You need to know pivot points and price action, right? Pivot points, you're probably going to get the best education in the swing trading course because it's the fundamental part of swing, or not fundamental, but it's a primary part of swing trading because you're identifying things that are going to make 300 pips, maybe more, right? So these are giant moves in the market. So you need to know what those lines are, but you need the price action so you know support resistance of price. And then, yeah, knowing some moving averages, crossovers, and some oscillators, but like, how could you be a foreign exchange trader, not know technical analysis of enough where you don't know what a moving average does, right? Or an oscillator, like, you should know these things. Even if you don't use them, you should know them, right? Like, you're you're a master of the universe, and you're like, well, what's the stochastics? Well, you better jump on that, boy, right? Like, that's something you need to know. You don't have to use it, but you should know it, right? And all that kind of stuff, and then pivot points, right? To me, that's the real... You don't have a leading indicator, how can you predict what's coming up tomorrow if you don't have a leading indicator? If you're always looking at what happened yesterday and I'm looking at what's going to happen tomorrow, right? We're, you know, you're looking in the past and I'm looking in the future. Which one do you, would you expect to be important setting up tomorrow's trades? What happened yesterday is going to be important to tomorrow's trades? Well, yeah. But how about looking at what's likely to happen tomorrow? That's probably even more important, right? So it's just all these things like just just put it all together slowly, break it all down. But this is a sport for kings, right? Isn't it? So you're going to need uh, money, right? If you don't have a right, and with your money, I wouldn't just throw it at trading. You're going to have to educate yourself. And then or you can... If you don't have a lot of money, it's going to take you a lot longer, but it's okay. Focus on the education first, get some trading experience and all that kind of stuff. Then the next part, 
once you got your education and you and you and you have two or three years of, of trading experience, you're pretty good. Now, especially if you don't have any money, you need to spend the next two or three or four years building a track record of success that can show to investors how educated you are, how skilled and disciplined you are, and then money will rain out of the sky because you're you're a profitable trader that with low volatility, right? and consistent returns and low drawdowns. And you can talk about central banking policy and macroeconomics and um, money supply and fractional reserve banking and all this kind of stuff. And you know your technical analysis and all this kind of stuff. And, you, and you're reading central bank reports and you just can spew knowledge about the foreign exchange market. And they're like, holy crap, this guy's an expert and he could help me make money. Then money falls out of the sky. Because the funny thing is, a rich person, there's not many rich per people in the world compared to how many poor people there are, right? So if you're poor, you're not that special. There's a lot of poor people, right? So it's more difficult to have to be the rich person. But the funny thing is, rich people have so much money that they don't know what to do with it. They can't even spend it, right? So all you have to do is like, Take this this resume, if you will, your track record and your knowledge, and you take it to a rich person. They're like, "Yeah, let's try it." Boom! <laughs> right? And now you don't have money problems anymore. You're, you're now no longer poor. And let me tell you, I'm saying what it's going to take you hard work and dedication and sacrifice, a, a sickening, right, ridiculous work ethic, and it's only going to be ten years. Maybe even less, maybe only eight years, and you will no longer be poor. If you have the hard work, the the dedication, and you get the knowledge, you get the skills, you get the passion, you have the track record to prove it, and then you can go out and your poverty goes away. But if you think of it like, well, Wayne, I, I just can't, I, I can't put in the eight years. Okay. That's Hey, I I grew up in rural Saskatchewan, single parent household. The reason I know right? Well, anyways, we don't need to go into all that. Like I came from nothing and I can change my life quickly and I did. Right? Yes, I worked for NASA. Yes, I worked with George Soros. Yes, I ran a company of 3,000 people. Yes, I worked for Cisco and Apple. Yes, I, I turned startups into successful. Yes, I, I've raised millions of dollars for other people. Didn't even charge them. And then, right? And then, after being a venture capitalist, doing something I love, I decided I'll be a currency trader. What's the point here? Right? The point is, I'm successful because I'm a, I work hard. Right? But also, like, what, what's the other thing? I'm 45 and I'm in college for crying out loud. I'm still passionate about learning. I want to learn more. I want to get better. Okay, all of this. So I still invest in education. I don't. I don't need to do it. People, have, all my friends are like, "Why do you do it?" I'm like, well, Harvard said yes, so I, so I'm in. It's an honor, right? I'm still focused on education. I right, 30 hours a week I probably put into to school. I can find the time. I worked all weekend to make those files for you guys, right? And I did the swing trading course and I did NFB on Friday, three hour speech, like, right? And I have family visiting, right? And I'm a, a husband to my wife and I took my, my whole family and everything. We, we do all the family things over the weekend. We went to two different fairs and festivals and stuff. And I'm at my desk at midnight doing my charts. That's all it takes. That's it. Does any of that take money? No. You got to know what you're doing and you got to get serious. You can't video game your way out of poverty. Right? But you can change your life. I was 18 in Saskatchewan. A few years later, running a company of 3,000 people in New York City. Right? 
In three or four years, you, well, in three or four years, I radically changed my life. And then three or four years after that, I radically changed my life in three or four years. And now I've just been doing Forex for 15 years, 20, well, more than, well, 15, certainly 15 years, right? Well, why is, why did I have to reinvent myself, you know, every four or five years? And now I've been doing this for 15 because there's nothing better than this. I don't want to change. You understand? This is the best. This is better than being a venture capitalist. This is better than being the CEO of a high tech startup. Right? This is better than working at NASA. NASA used to pay me my commute time. They'd say, oh, well, it takes you an hour to get to work. So we'll pay you two hours per day on top of the hours you work. <laughs> I'm like, really? You're going to pay me my commute time? Like, what's, what's the scam here? Right? Forex is the best thing you could possibly do with the rest of your life. It'll change your life. It'll change your family's life and your loved ones and your friends and your community. It'll radically change everything. Um, but if it's going to, if eight years is too much work, that's your call. So I got to go, bro. I got hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of homework to do today. So peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May our profits be above average. I hope you kick some ass and get this done. You can do it. Just have to work your ass off.